Hey, I'm Jonathan Carl. Welcome to lecture number two. As we go through this book, uh, Spiritual Warfare in the Bible, you can download it free uh, as a PDF on spiritualwarfare.blog, uh, or you can get a paper version if you prefer that on Amazon or a Kindle version. Um, but this is lecture two. The first lecture was looking at uh, who God is and who Satan is. And one thing we talked about is in warfare, you know, one of the things you learn is how do I identify friend or foe? How do I identify uh, what the other uh, forces look like, how, what their abilities, capabilities are, what their strategies and tactics, and likewise, understanding what do our friends look like, what, do, what, what, uh, what are their capabilities, abilities, uh, what's their nature, their strategies, their tactics. And so we started out looking at God and Satan. And if you haven't been through that video yet or looked at those scriptures, strongly encourage you uh, either read that in the book or on the website, spiritualwarfare.blog. Uh, but for today, we're looking at angels and demons. This is lecture two. Angels and demons, we're going to look at their names, their abilities, their works, their character. What are they like? And so we know in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All things were created by him, but also there are these things that are invisible. And although demons and angels at times can reveal themselves uh, when they have permission to humans, most of the time we would consider them invisible. They're unseen, but we know they're here, and which makes it particularly interesting. What are they doing? Who are they? Uh, what do we need to know about them? And what do we uh, not really know about them yet? And so Colossians 1.16 explains that to us, and we're also reminded in this that Satan and his servants can disguise themselves as being an angel, an unfallen angel, a faithful angel of God that can disguise themselves. So this is a territory we need to be really clear about. Uh, some of the names of angels, we know angels are created beings. They're spiritual beings. They have moral judgment, high intelligence, but they don't have physical bodies. Some of the names we see across the scripture for angels are uh, angel, cherubim, host of heaven, they're visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, holy ones, heavenly beings, living creatures, seraphim, sons of God, spirits, elemental spirits, ministering spirits, the seven spirits, those who are with us, and the watchers. And you might know some of those references or all of those references, but if not, uh, my encouragement would be for you to get into the scripture. Uh, those names and the specific references are both in this book, but also on spiritualwarfare.blog. There's two named angels. Do you know them? Do you know them? A little trivia. Do you know them? You might already know them. We know the archangel Michael is a named angel who's revealed to us in Jude, Daniel, and Revelation. And we know Gabriel, who is referenced in uh, corresponding with Daniel, but also in Mary and Zechariah. Uh, three cautions and warnings about angels. One, we need to know this. Satan disguises himself. I already mentioned it as an unfallen angel to deceive us. So that's a big flag that God's raising to warn us that Satan will try to deceive us. Now we see this actually occurs in several faith groups. We see Mormonism has an angelic a uh, narr narrative or story of Moroni appearing to Joseph Smith. We see Jehovah's Witnesses believe the archangel Michael is a pre-incarnate Jesus. We see Islam has a tradition, a story of Gabriel or Jibril to Muhammad, Michael, Mikhail, and Raphael, Is Israfil, and Azrael. Um, they believe also in seven archangels. So we see uh, these breakoffs, these cults or sects of Christianity, and we see Islam, this world religion, have these narrations of angels um, that don't correspond with the biblical narrative. We also see this, unfortunately, unfortunately, in Catholicism. We see Raphael and Azarias as one of the seven in the book of Tobit, um, an angelic command issues to burn fish guts and drive the demonic away that they receive worship. Now, this is a touchy subject with Roman Catholicism. There's another book um, that I've written. You can download it on spiritualwarfare.blog, um, but it's a comparison of the catechism of the Catholic Church with the Bible. And this is one of these areas with angels that there's a very significant and important discrepancy between the two. And we have to make a decision. What do we believe? They can't both be true. Either the Bible is true or the Roman uh, catechism of the Catholic Church is true. So see for yourself that evidence. Again, you can download it, uh, a biblical study of the Catholic catechism. 
Together, as we continue with the cautions and warnings, um, we see these two passages already read from 2 Corinthians 11, but 1 John 4, God implores us, don't believe every single spirit, right? Uh, spirits may appear to you, may speak to you. Don't believe every single spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we need to test the spirits and examine is what are they saying? What they are doing, does it correspond with the scripture or not? Secondly, we need to avoid false teachings and examples that go towards the worship of angels. Uh, Colossians 2.18 warns us that people are going to insist on, one of the things, worship of angels. They're going to go in detail about visions. They're going to get puffed up, and they're not holding on to the head. Who's the head? Jesus. So we got to watch out. There's going to be deviations from the focus on Jesus towards a focus on angels. Some places we can see that in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, you see this. This is not uh, me telling you this. This is you can look it up uh, yourself in these paragraphs of the Catholic Catechism where it's emphasizing the veneration of angels, that every believer has an angel as a protector and a shepherd leading them to life, and that there's certain focus on St. Michael, St. Gabriel, St. Raphael, and the guardian angels in particular. Now, we need to be also cautious because uh, we are warned by God in several places, Exodus 20, verse 4 being one of them, against images or icons or amulets or charms or fetishes. And within the Catechism of the Catholic Church, there's an a, a emphasis, uh, we can see this in practice, but there's also emphasis in the teaching uh, to have holy images, not just of God, um, but also of angels. And so we need to be careful of that, uh, that practice that teaching, that's one of the warnings we have about angels. Third, we need to examine any experiential encounters towards the worship of angels, okay? Uh, Revelation 22, we can see that when an angel is encountered, there's going to be a temptation just to fall in worship because they are so amazing, but they will not receive worship. If an angel receives our worship, then we need to be aware that's probably a demonic encounter, not an encounter with a faithful angel. Faithful angels always redirect worship towards God and say, I'm, I'm a servant like you. Um, and that can turn into idolatry through the worship of angels. And there can be a temptation to pursue communication, not just with dead relatives, but also with angels rather than going to God. So there's warnings of these encounters across scripture. We know from Hebrews 1.14, all ministering spirits, remember that's one of the names of angels, they're sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. But we also know there's fallen angels, right? Faithless, disobedient angels we call demons. Faithful angels are those who are perfectly, 100% obedient to God across the whole scripture. Some of their works, some of what they do, it's very important. Whoops. Going through that again. There we go. Four responses to it, okay? Four responses in terms of angels. In fact, actually, let me read you some of their works real quick. Some of their works, I can't read all of them here, but let me read some of the works of the angels. Um, <clears throat> they are messengers of the law, messengers of revelation. Um, they give instruction and understanding. They encourage. They announce the birth of the child. Uh, they call to obey, follow, and lead. Sometimes they bring judgment. Sometimes they rebuke. Sometimes they bring out future judgment, prophecies of future judgment, future deliverance, and future events. Uh, sometimes God sends it out an angel in response to prayer. There's a court of witness witnesses. Sometimes they're described as a guard. Sometimes they gather and they destroy. They bring judgment and wrath. Sometimes they guide. Sometimes they stop disobedience. Sometimes they discipline. Sometimes they protect, sometimes they provide, sometimes they bring forgiveness from God and they deliver and they save. Sometimes they minister to the needs of the children of God. Sometimes they minister to Jesus, their creator. And sometimes we see them singing and praising and worship. And so we can see all these works as part of who they are. And our response to that is to see um, God for, first focus on Jesus 
<clears throat> Again, as amazing as angels are, we need to remember first and foremost, our, our sight, our perception, our direction needs to be focused on Jesus, that he is the example we follow of servant leadership. We also need to see that all of creation, both angels, which are great, and small humanity, us, we are all both designed to serve God. We see that in Revelation 19. And that together we worship God alone. He is to be our focus. And that Jesus is far greater than all the angels. If you haven't read that before in Hebrews 1, it's an amazing passage about the greatness of Jesus in comparison to the angels. What about their character? We see that God sends out uh, his angels, that they are doing his bidding. I read some of the works of them, but here's some of their character, what they are like. They're created, but they're finite. They're limited, but they live eternally. They're righteous. They're perfectly obedient. They are strong. They are mighty. They are powerful. At one point, God sends out an angel to destroy 185,000 Assyrians. They can be intimidating, awe-inspiring, Sometimes they're seen, but sometimes they're unseen. They're numerous. They can appear physically as humans. They appear supernaturally at times. They can be seen sometimes by animals when they're not seen by humans. They can disappear supernaturally. They can fly. They can move in supernatural ways. They can interact with people in physical objects sometimes by touch. <clears throat> sometimes they interact with physical objects without touch. They can see, they're described as the watchers. They can hear, they can speak, they can communicate, sometimes directly and through dreams and visions. They can think, they can feel emotions of joy and praise. They always refuse worship and redirect all worship to God as fellow servants. They withhold their name when requested to honor the angel. They communicate their name at times. We talked about this with Gabriel and Michael. They provide supernaturally at times. They can sometimes eat, but sometimes instead of eating, they guide sacrifice towards God in worship. They can consume food with spontaneous fire. They can cause blindness, cause muteness. They can kill supernaturally, and they can bring forgiveness from God, and they can help and minister. So that's some of their character, what they're like and their abilities. What about demons? What about fallen angels? Well, we see that they're connected directly with carved images and idols. And even those are, though those are physical objects, um, that there is a direct demonic connection throughout the scripture to idols and carved images. Uh, they're deceitful spirits. They're demons, elementary principles, evil spirits, goat demons, lowercase gods that aren't really God. They are harmful spirits, host of heaven, lying spirit. The spirit, spirit of the Antichrist, spirit of error, spirit of divination, unclean spirit, uh, and, um, oh, I missed the one, sons of God, or the Nephilim. <clears throat> now, one thing we need to be careful of, a lot of people with modern day, we'll talk about it in another video, modern day approaches to spiritual warfare, they'll try to dialogue and converse with the demons to gain their name, as if knowing their name gives them special power or ability over the demons. Listen, the demons will take you down all kinds of rabbit trails that you don't need to follow. If they claim some sort of name or speak some sort of name, it doesn't matter. Don't follow their deceit. Uh, the, all the names we need to know of demons are given to us in the scripture. What about their works? Now we see there's a war going on. We see this in Revelation very uh, described very vividly. But what kind of works do they do? Well, let me read some of them to you. They battle against the faithful angels. <clears throat> they deceive and work through false prophets, false signs, false wonders. They desire attention and worship. They sometimes cause disease and sickness. They participate in part of divination and fortune telling. They do Satan's works. They oppose humanity. They accuse, they tempt, they dwell among humanity. They enslave. They flee from the spirit of God. They indwell some unbelievers and their works, and they communicate with other demons, and they can harm and do harm human hosts. They rebel, they sin, they tempt towards pride, unrighteousness, and division. And at times, they work through government leaders. The Bible tells us a whole lot about the work of demons. It also tells us a lot about the character of demons. So here's some of their abilities. 
Here's some of their characteristics. They are able to move and indwell humans. Sometimes we see multiple demons in one person. Sometimes they are seen in animals. And sometimes we see them communicate and work with other demons and harm their hosts. They are afraid of hell. They're afraid of the abyss. They're afraid of God. They recognize God. They are against God. They have angelic abilities. So when we read about the angels' abilities and their character, we have to remember demons are fallen angels. Uh, we don't want to speculate on what we don't know, but if faithful angels have certain abilities, it's likely that fallen angels have similar, have retained similar abilities as they serve and imitate Satan and his character. But they can't remove our salvation as Christians. They can't remove our salvation. They are powerful and strong, but they can't do that. They can't separate us from God's love. Uh, they cast out by Jesus from a distance with no particular phrase or command. Sometimes they're cast out by Jesus with a brief command of rebuke. They're described as deceivers, liars, insincere. There's degrees of wickedness among them. They desire worship. They're disguised. They're doomed. They enslave. They harass believers when they're allowed to. They harm human hosts. At times we see forcing people into fire and water, causing deafness and muteness, seizures. They harm non-believers. They can see, speak, think, cause convulsions, scream loudly. They instill jealousy, selfish ambition, boasting, disorder, and vile practices. But they have limited abilities. They cannot read the minds or dreams of King Nebuchadnezzar. And we see this in uh, Daniel. Uh, they're overpowered by the name of Jesus in the mouths of true believers. They're persistent, annoying, and they attempt to profit off God's workers. They have limited foreknowledge. They're supernaturally strong. They can physically control the possessed, but they are ultimately unable to resist Jesus' power when they are cast out in silence. Now, there's a lot right there. Um, the scriptures describe that. If you get into the book or the website, spiritualwarfare.blog, you can see those corresponding scriptures to the abilities, the characteristics I just read. Here's 10 things, 10 important responses I want to encourage you with when you consider the demonic. One, don't be afraid of them ultimately. Um, they are strong and powerful, but we need to fear God, not Satan as demons. I love 1 John 4, 4. If you are in Christ, if you're a Christian, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And if you're not yet a Christian, may your consideration of the demonic and the angelic motivate you, encourage you to take serious God's gospel invite, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart he died on the cross and rose from the grave, you too can be saved and indwelt by God's Holy Spirit which is far more powerful than any demon at all. All the demons combined, it's more powerful, the Holy Spirit. Uh, ultimately, there's also a call and a warning here uh, to see that the demons are real and they're really tempting us so that when you face temptations, understand that the behind the scenes are the demonic sometimes trying to pull you in that direction. So we want to turn from wickedness and turn to God. We want to confess our sin to God when we fail. We want to destroy evil items. If you have items that are connected with false worship, demonic worship, idols, uh, ask God, what do you want me to do with this? And uh, destroy them um, by fire would be my encouragement. Uh, don't hold on to stuff of those old ways. Don't be fascinated. Um, if you are part of any false worship or idolatry in the past, just get rid of it, destroy it, and ask God for forgiveness from it. Uh, keep your focus on God. Don't get distracted by the demons. A lot of times they'll try to distract you. Share the gospel regularly. The gospel is the hope. Uh, sometimes there is a calling to cast out demons. That's rare, but the gospel should be our regular way of taking out the power of God. We need to put on the full armor of God every single day. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Uh, we need to walk in freedom and not going back to the old way of things, our old way of life. We need to speak of Jesus's power and goodness, and we get to and need to test the spirits and the teachings to be careful with what we're hearing because the demons do work through teachings explicitly. Again, this is all from the Spiritual Warfare in the Bible. This is lecture number two. Uh, I hope you'll watch some more lectures and consider downloading for free this book and sharing it with others as well. Thanks so much.